Okay class, so now we're going to start part B on the cell cycle and in this part we're going to mainly look at some of the um, sort of uh, mechanical aspects of the cell cycle and how they're actually regulated by the cyclin CDKs and as well as the APCC, so some of the checkpoints. Um, so you guys have seen this before, we covered it when we were covering um, the cytoskeleton. Uh, this is basically the mitotic spindles. Um, what you have is a pair of centrosomes and then you have microtubules coming off them, your astral microtubules, your kinetochore microtubules which are actually attached to the sister chromatid via the kinetochore and then you have your interpolar um, microtubules which uh, sort of connect the two um, centrosomes together via, um, via the microtubules there. Um, and these all have different roles in sort of uh, during the cell cycle. Okay, so if we take a quick look at the centrosome, what you can see is um, there's actually uh, a pair of them and, and they go through division um, and get separated eventually to um, opposite poles of the cell. And this is also is enriched with gamma tubulin, which is a, a, a nucleating agent for the microtubules. Okay, and so the big take home message here is the microtubules um, in the sort of mitotic spindle um, originate from uh, the centrosome, okay? Um, now, the various microtubules in the motors are, are really integral for um, spindle assembly, okay? And you have a, a bunch of different motors. You have um, cytoplasmic dynein, um, which is a minus N directed motor, and then you have um, kinesin uh, 14, which is um, also a minus directed motor and kinesin 5, which is a plus N directed motor. Okay, and so these are creating pulling and pushing forces on the microtubules to sort of position everything properly um, and get the centrosomes organized um, for microtubule capture. Okay, um, so kinesin 5 is pushing them apart, um, kinesin 4 sort of pulling them together and dyne um, and cytoplasmic dynein is uh, sort of, it's a minus N directed motor, so it's um, sort of trying to position the centrosome. Um, now, the centrioles are actually uh, undergo a replication process, and this occurs throughout the, um, the cell cycle. And there's not a lot known about how these um, are actually uh, replicated, they just seem to sort of break off and a new one starts to um, sort of start creating and then eventually during M phase they, they move to opposite poles of the cell, okay. Um, and in the case with yeast, as I mentioned, the nuclear envelope doesn't break down but you, it still has a mitotic spindle within the nucleus and here you can actually see it. Um, and you know, it's been, it's already started to form in the nucleus. So um, even though the nuclear envelope doesn't break down, um, the, the mitotic spindle still assembles. And you can actually see the effects of the various motor proteins on this in Saccharomyces. So here's uh, sort of the normal spindle. And then if you overexpress a protein called CAR3P, which um, is the kinesin 14, which basically pulls the, um, it, it pulls the spindle together. You can actually see if you're overexpressing it, the spindle gets shorter. Um, and then you have uh, SYN8P, which actually forces the spindle apart. Um, and so when you exp overexpress that motor protein, which is a kinesin 5, um, the, the spindle length actually increases over the normal spindle. Um, Another thing that happens during mitosis is the microtubules become highly unstable, okay? Um, and the, the instability is actually a very, very important part of um, the spindle assembly and actual capture of the chromosomes via the microtubule binding uh, and associating with the kinetochore, okay? So here's just a plain old interphase extract um, and they're looking at basically um, microtubule length and the number of catastrophe events, that's when the microtubule sort of peels apart. Um, and then if they look in a mitotic extract, um, that actually causes the microtubules to become that much more unstable. And so in this instance, they're sort of growing in, 
shrinking, growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking. Now, if you deplete the maps, okay, these are microtubule associated proteins that help stabilize the microtubules. Um, if you get rid of them, uh, the number of catastrophe events um, dramatically increases. Okay, but then if you get rid of the maps and the catastrophe factors, you get a, the microtubules to be a little bit more stable here. Okay, so the big take home message is here is for you guys to appreciate that, you know, microtubule instability is a really integral part of mitosis. Um, because constantly the microtubules are growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking, um, almost as if they're going out and sort of fishing and searching for a kinetochore on the condensed um, chromosomes, the condensed sister chromatids to actually bind to. Okay, um, there's also a, a self-organization um, event that occurs here. Okay, and so the spindle needs to sort of assemble properly. Okay, so you get a state where all the microtubules are sort of nucleating um, and sort of growing out in the plus direction. And then there's some anti-parallel cross-linking by kinesin-5, which actually helps to sort of arrange the things because the kinesin is going to push them uh, to the plus ends and sort of push them away from each other. Um, and then you basically get sort of an outward push by kinesin-4 and kinesin-10, and eventually the cytoplasmic dynings and kinesin-14 will actually help sort of organize and focus all of the spindle poles. So all of the minus ends are um, sort of near the centrosome um, and attached to the centrosome when it's there, um, and the plus ends are uh, sort of um, out. And these can actually make interpolar um, microtubule attachments. Um, and so the, the bipolar spindles can actually form even without the, the centrosome, right? And that's kind of what this figure right here was um, designed to, to show. You know, these motor proteins can help focus the spindle even without a centrosome present. So here is a normal um, uh, cell going through mitosis where you have the spindle poles, uh, the chromosomes are sort of organized in, in sort of orange here, um, and then if you get rid of the centrosomes, you can still form this uh, sort of um, uh, spindle pole, the bipolar spindles, um, in the absence of the centrosome, okay? And so once again, you're going sort of back to, to this scenario right here. Um, um, so the other important thing to appreciate is the kinetic core attachment and actually how the sister chromatids are separated um, and what happens to the microtubules at the kinetic core, okay? Because there's actually no motor proteins involved in actually separating the sister chromatids. Um, and here's the attachment. You have your kinetic core microtubules attached to the kinetic cores, um, and there's a bipolar attachment, um, and the... Uh, the sister chromatids are held together um, by cohesin, right? And the rest of the chromosomes are condensed with the condensin. Okay, so here you can see this nice stain here where you have the kinetic core stained in red. Um, so it looks very similar to this schematic that's here. Um, if you take a little EM of it, you can actually see the microtubules um, attached to the kinetic core right here. Um, and this happens to be an anaphase chromatid, so it's actually being pulled apart. It's already sort of past the um, metaphase to anaphase checkpoint, um, and it's sort of bent backwards as the chromosome is sort of being pulled to the right here, okay? Um, and here's just a sort of a schematic of the microtubule attachment. Um, you'll have your microtubule here, and it goes, and there's the, the exposed plus end, um, and it's sort of wrapped around. It's got a little, almost like a little belt around it, um, and then you have sort of your inner kinetic core here, okay? And so the kinetic core attachment um, is also a multi-step process, okay? So you have your um, spindle pole with the microtubules growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking, um, in sort of search of a chromosome, and then they eventually find one and they get this sort of lateral attachment. That actually sort of, then the chromosome actually starts to move to the spindle pole until it eventually gets a unipolar attachment to the kinetic core. Um, and then it's also looking for one on the other side, um, doing sort of the same thing, 
and eventually when it gets a bipolar attachment, this is what's sort of considered a stable state, okay? And then it gets sort of moved into position um, by one microtubule growing and the other shrinking um, to sort of move it along the metaphase plate um, and get it all aligned so it can proceed from um, metaphase to anaphase and undergo the metaphase to anaphase transition. Um, and so here's just a sort of a schematic of, of how that sort of looks. You, if you have um, one um, micro, if you have one set of microtubules only touched to attached to one kinetic core, this is considered unstable. If you have two of them attached to uh, the same uh, microtubules originating from the same centrosome, um, once again, that's unstable. Um, if you have two on opposite ones to a single kinetic core, that's considered unstable. It's only when you have this sort of bipolar attachment um, to both, uh, to both um, centrosomes uh, do you actually get this sort of stable state. And then, like I said, the microtubules will then grow and shrink depending to sort of align the chromosomes along the metaphase plate. Um, and it's believed that it's this tension that exists that's sort of um, giving this its sort of um, complete uh, and stable, you know, enhanced stability here, right? You need the, the polar forces pulling, trying to pull them apart while you still have um, uh, cohesion holding them, to, holding the sister chromatids together. Okay, and so when you actually get separation, um, and this happens at the, uh, at the start of anaphase, so you go from metaphase to anaphase transition, and the sister chromatids are released from one another, and the microtubules start to just depolymerize. Okay, there's no motor proteins here, just the single depolymerization of this, and if you guys remember back to the catastrophe events and dynamic instability that we were talking about when we covered microtubules, what ends up happening is this just slides down the microtubule um, towards uh, the attached um, centrosome, okay? And so it's this depolymerization that actually is doing all of the force and the, and the pulling. There is no motor proteins involved in this process, okay? Um, and while the, you sort of have the proteins or the, the, the sister chromatids aligned on the metaphase plate and they're getting aligned, there's also a lot of microtubule flux, right? We've already sort of seen that you know, there's this dynamic instability that exists um, with the um, mitotic spindles, um, with, the, with the microtubules growing and shrinking, um, but occasionally they'll get stabilized by the microtubule-associated proteins, especially when they get, you know, a bipolar attachment. Um, and as the chromosomes are sort of sitting aligned on the metaphase plate, there's a lot of microtubule flux where um, the uh, microtubule protein um, tubulin, the uh, alpha and beta form are actually getting added to the microtubule and um, on the plus end and then you get loss on the minus end and you see this sort of flux as the movement of the um, alpha and beta tubulin down towards the minus end of the microtubules. Um, to show you that a little bit better, um, what you end up having here is a cell uh, the individual subunits of the microtubules are shown here stained in red, and here sort of in this brown is um, uh, chromosomes aligned along the, uh, the metaphase plate, and here is um, sort of one centri um, centrosome, and here's the other centrosome. And if you sort of look at just this slice right here, over time, as time goes by, you'll see that there's microtubule flux towards um, the centrosome, okay? And you can see that as it goes, um, you know, the, the microtubules are moving down towards the minus N because you have plus N directed growth. Okay, so this is a time-lapse video of this slice that's happening right here, and you can see that the microtubules are going down. It's a little easier to see in this schematic exactly what's happening, so I encourage you to sort of look at um, the combination of this one and the previous slide, where you have basically the addition of tubulin. Occasionally, a red one is going to get put in, um, and that's going to basically travel down towards the spindle pole. Okay, 
um, and likewise here that's going to travel down this the spindle pole um, and it shows it over here a little faster there's more um, and so ultimately the tubulin is going to be basically moving towards the centrosome as everything's being sort of aligned on the metaphase plate okay um, you also have other polar forces that are existing um, and, and this happens in, you know, pro-metaphase to metaphase um, where, you know, you can get a unipolar attachment and then if you actually cut with a laser, what ends up happening is the unipolar attachment in the microtubules actually pull the kinetic core um, portion of it to, um, to the spindle whereas the uh, other microtubules are actually causing a force and basically force the other arm away from the pole, okay? And, and these forces exist on the um, sister chromatids and on the chromosomes when they're actually being pulled apart. And it may be that they do that just to help them keep them untangled, okay? And so here's uh, basically what's happening. You have um, your kinetic core microtubules pushing and then oftentimes the interpolar microtubules will have a, a motor protein, kinesin 4 or 10, that's sort of pushing the chromosome out, okay? And so even though there's no motor protein necessary um, uh, for the kinetic core attachment, you do have motor proteins that are sort of pushing the ends of the chromosomes out um, as it's moving. Um, and, and this is actually also very important in sort of aligning the, the sister chromatids at the metaphase plate. Um, and you can really sort of see that um, if you look at um, a uh, sort of an immunofluorescence of what's happening here, right? You have your sister chromatids being aligned um, at the metaphase plate, and then when it goes from metaphase to anaphase, it sort of pulls them and they sort of, uh, sort of loop back depending on the chromosome, and they create almost like these little V-shaped uh, things. Um, and what's actually triggering um, this thing to sort of come apart, the APCC complex triggers anaphase and actually separates, um, helps to separate the chromosomes, and we'll see the mechanism for that in, in the next slide. Um, but before we move to that, one of the things I want to impress upon all you guys, there are hundreds of beautiful um, images on YouTube and video microscopy of cells undergoing mitosis. Um, I encourage you all to look at them. It's really just beautiful um, to look at some of them. You can actually see the chromosomes start to condense and it really gives you a much better understanding of um, what exactly is happening in these um, video microscopies of mitosis. They're just, they're just really stunning. Uh, to see how the chromosomes um, sort of, they'll all sort of wiggle together and then all of a sudden they'll be all aligned and then poof, and the cell just starts to divide and it's just a really beautiful thing to look at. Um, and that poof I just talked about is basically happens here, okay? So once you have all of the um, chromosomes sort of aligned on the metaphase plate, and they're attached together with the cohesin complex, um, and you get the metaphase to anaphase transition. What ends up happening is CDC20 associates with the inactive APCC, and that makes the APCC active. And what that does is it, you, um, it ubiquitolates um, this protein securin, uh, which is associated with separatase, and when separatase and securin are attached, uh, in a complex, the separatase is inactive. Once you remove the securin, separatase becomes active and it cleaves the um, uh, cohesin molecule and that allows the, the um, sister chromatids to be released from one another and they get pulled apart. And so if you guys watch those videos that I was just talking about, it's really like a little poof and it just happens immediately and they just start to all pull apart. It's very, very beautiful. I, I encourage you all to, to watch them. Um, and so at this stage though, right here, there's actually a, a, a checkpoint um, to make sure that all of the chromosomes are aligned um, at metaphase, okay? And there's this protein called MAD2, which will actually associate um, with an unattached kinetochore. 
which basically if you have an un, a single unattached kinetic core, it can't align properly. And so this will actually sort of prevent um, the uh, APCC to, um, and CDC20 interaction to make that complex active. Okay, it's not till you'll get a bipolar attachment and this moving to um, sort of the center with all of the other chromosomes um, will you get that. And so MAD2 is sort of here a negative regulator of the metaphase to anaphase transition. Um, now in anaphase, there's actually two sort of um, subphases, anaphase A and anaphase B. Okay, and anaphase A happens when the cohesin basically gets cleaved and the chromosomes um, start to move towards the opposite spindles. Okay, and, um, and in this whole process, you know, the, the kinetic core microtubules will just shorten and the, the force pulls the, the chromosomes to each of the poles. Okay, um, and then in sort of anaphase B, what you're getting um, is basically the interpolar um, microtubules with the motor proteins attached, they actually start to force the spindles apart. Okay, and so there's greater distance then between um, these two spindles here. And, and that actually is, is really important uh, to sort of help separate the cells. Okay, and you know, while this is sort of all happening, the, the contractile ring starts to form, and the contractile ring is mostly made up of myosin and actin, and as the interpolar microtubules are pushing the poles apart, the contractile ring starts to form and pinch the two cells, up, um, and pinch the two cells so they can eventually become two independent cells. So pinch a single cell so it be can become two independent cells. All right, and this is uh, sort of creates what's called the cleavage furrow. Um, and normally during this whole process of cytokinesis, you're going to get equal distribution of uh, the cytoplasmic components. There's exceptions to this rule, and we'll see some exceptions um, later later on. But for general, for your general sort of understanding of it, just realize that you know the cytoplasmic com components are actually divided amongst the cells. Um, and here's basically the the contractile ring um, in uh, the Xenopus egg. This was the the frog egg that we looked at before. It's pretty easy to to see it, it's, it's um, you know, nice and large, and in this cleavage furrow underneath it, um, you have a bunch of actin and myosin sort of pinching the two cells together. Um, and here's just a, another sort of, um, uh, sort of higher magnification view of um, that cleavage furrow. Um, and so what's happening here is you basically get this contractile ring, and between the actin and the myosin moving on it, it continues to sort of shrink it and shrink it and shrink it. Uh, um, and left between are the interpolar um, microtubules. Um, okay, and so here's just a nice EM of the contractile ring. You can see this sort of dense staining. This is all of the actin um, and myosin too that's sort of pulling it together. And you can see that better in this immunofluorescence image um, here all the actin is stained in red um, and the myosin is stained in green here. So here you can see this contractile ring creating the sort of the cleavage furrow. Um, here's uh, basically two fibroblasts dividing and once again it creates this sort of mid body and if you want to look at what the mid body looks like you sort of have this dense material with the actin and myosin and then you can sort of see the interpolar microtubules um, and then sort of the in some of the cellular uh, constituents. Um, there's some vesicles and, and some uh, membrane enclosed uh, organelles here um, as it's being basically pinched apart in this sort of mid body. And here's cell A and here is um, the cell B. Um, okay, so the contractile ring is actually regulated by a small G protein rho. Um, and we've seen the, the um, rho signaling in other sort of um, actin and myosin regulated events. Um, and so here you, once again, you have your inactive rho, it's a small G protein. The rho GEF will exchange the GDP for GTP. Um, and then the active rho 
uh, will basically signal to formin to lead to actin filament formation, and Rho can then also activate uh, Rho activated kinases, which can then um, basically phosphorylate the the myosin light chains, um, and then you'll get myosin two activation, and that forms the contractile ring. Um, and once the contractile ring is no longer sort of needed, the row gap will restore row back to its inactive state um, by basically causing the, the hydrolysis of the GTP back to GDP. Um, and here you can sort of see that again, row A um, is stained in red here, um, and the CYK4 is stained in green, and it sort of aligns um, on, the, uh, on the contractile ring or where the contractile ring is going to form. Okay. Um, now, as I sort of mentioned, there's not always equal distribution of the um, cytoplasmic components, and this oftentimes will happen during development where certain uh, cellular components need to go with one cell and not the other. Um, and so if you sort of look here, um, you have the DNA stained in blue, and then you start to get your um, contractile ring and cleavage, and you can see that uh, you know, the cytoplasmic component stained in green here is actually going to go to the posterior and not the anterior part of the cell, um, and so all of it will go with one. So, it's, you know, for most instances in a cell dividing in a tissue culture plate, um, you know, or a cell dividing in your body will, you know, divide, you know, equally amongst itself. Um, however, there is oftentimes um, asymmetric distribution of some of the cytoplasmic components. Um, another thing, too, that you can actually have the cell cycle without any cytokinesis at all, um, and this happens in the Drosophila embryo where you have a shared syscytium, um, and, you know, they'll undergo nuclear divisions um, even though there's no cell membrane, okay? And so you're just basically increasing the number of nuclei and then eventually the cells will start to form around that and then you have a basically a completed completed embryo with a whole bunch of cells and then these cells will undergo further um, cell division okay and so occasionally you can just get cell division without any kind of cytokinesis um, if there's a, a, a shared sort of cytosol or a shared syscytium where you have many nuclei in um, sort of a single uh, cell here um, and, and here's a, just a beautiful figure of that, of a s synchronized Drosophila embryo, and you have basically all of these um, mitotic spindles forming all at the same time, um, and they're just dividing, and there's no cytokinesis happening here. The nuclei are just dividing. Okay. Um, and so one of the things, too, that you need to know is, is G1 is sort of a stable state, right? And this is basically where the CDKs are, are inactive due to, um, like, a CKI or something like that. Okay, so in an em embryonic cell where there is no um, G1, you just have cycles between um, APC activity and the M-cyclin and CDK, okay? And they'll just oscillate between M and S phase, okay? But if you have basically... a um, cells with a G1, what will end up happening is, of course, the M cyclin level drops, and then at the um, metaphase to anaphase transition, you'll have active CDC20, APC activity, and then that's eventually lost um, in G1, and then you'll get basically um, the uh, situation where, you know, the you have basically a stable state, whereas the CDH1 APC um, activity is just, uh, you know, keeps the M cyclin level um, just low, okay, and M does not come back up again, okay, and, and that's a sort of a, a, a stable state, and that's why a cell can exist in G1 or sometimes what they call G0, um, you know, before it can re-enter the, um, the cell cycle. Um, okay, now on to meiosis. So meiosis is actually happens in germ cells, okay, and because germ cells have basically one copy of every chromosome. Most um, somatic cells are going to have two copies or be 2N, and so once again, you know, you'll, for mitosis, you're going to have basically um, DNA replication where you copy all of the chromosomes, and then they're duplicated, they're aligned um, along the metaphase plate, and then they basically go through anaphase and cytokinesis, and eventually you'll get to 
um, diploid daughter cells with the same two chromosomes that it started off with that were copied. Okay, in meiosis things are a little bit different, right? You, you have your parental chromosome and your maternal chromosome and they'll actually get um, basically replicated. Okay, and so now you have basically four copies of every chromosome. So you'll have four copies of chromosome one, four copies of chromosome two. Um, and then what ends up happening is when these sort of are paired during meiosis, you can get the crossover event. This is where homologous recombination is occurring um, to basically add to some diversity. Okay, and this happens in germ cells. Okay, and so then the first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna have meiosis one where you'll separate um, the uh, chromosomes um, that have actually had crossover events occur and then once again during meiosis two they'll get separated again and eventually you're left with four haploid gametes either um, eggs or sperm okay and once again you know you're going to have some crossover events so that the chromosomes are sort of mixed okay um, and so um, once again, you know, this is just kind of a cool thing, and, and you guys should know the difference between mitosis and meiosis. Um, and once again, here's the crossovers. They're actually very common um, in meiosis, uh, and they basically happen in, in um, meiotic prophase 1. It's actually a regulated event where SPO11 um, comes in here and will actually cleave the chromosomes at specific regions uh, to sort of assist this process so the crossovers can occur and this leads to more genetic diversity. Um, and once again, the, this crossover event occurs by homologous recombination, so I encourage you guys to go back and look at um, homologous recombination. Um, okay. Um, and meiosis one only has a, a single attachment to the microtubules, right? The sister chromatids actually stay together, right? And this is, this is sort of, think about this for one second here. These are aligned, um, but you'll only have a single attachment here and a single attachment here um, when these things get pulled apart. And then during meiosis two, when these individual sister, the homologs get, um, of the sister chromatids get pulled apart, um, they'll actually have a bipolar attachment. Um, okay, so now we want to look at how the cell cycle sort of regulated in multicellular organisms. Okay, so normally if you have a yeast cell growing in, you know, which is a single cell organism growing in a culture of media, it can sense whether or not there's enough media around. But, you know, cells in our body um, actually require signals um, for which to divide. Okay, and some of the ones that do this are called mitogens, and these mitogens induce the cell cycle. A perfect example of a mitogen is PDGF, or platelet-derived growth factor. Um, here's actually a thing of a, a platelet, um, and it has these secretory vesicles will fuse um, and release uh, the um, platelet-derived growth factor to cells, and this oftentimes will happen um, where you sort of get a wound, okay, these are involved in blood clotting, so if you cut your finger or something like that, the, the platelets will all sort of coagulate there, and then they're releasing um, platelet-derived growth factor in order to, to tell the cells in and around the cut site um, where, you know, they should start dividing to heal the wound, okay. Um, but in general, there's over 50 um, different mitogens in the cell. Another example is EGF or epidermal growth factor. Um, and this protein that we looked at when we were looking at signaling, TGF beta actually opposes um, the, active, the activity of the mitogens. Um, and so here's basically the, the mitogen signaling. You'll have the mitogen binding to a mitogen receptor, which can then eventually signal through RAS. RAS will then um, sort of activate the MAP kinase cascade. Um, and eventually you'll get uh, gene regulatory protein um, in the sort of the immediate early response, and that can lead to production of MYC, um, and then MYC will then basically start to produce um, active uh, um, G1 CDK, cyclin CD, cyclin, G1 cyclin CDK, which can then go on to phosphorylate this really sort of famous protein called RB, or retin, retinoblastoma protein, RB. Okay, which normally retinoblastoma protein 
um, RB keeps the um, EF2 protein, which is needed for cell cycle progression, in an inactive state. Okay, and so, but when the G1 CDK phosphorylates it, it no longer binds to EF2, and then um, EF2 then leads to S phase gene um, transcription, which then produces the S cyclin, um, and then you'll have active SCDK, which can then feed back and, and basically lead to more phosphorylation of RB, and then eventually you'll get DNA synthesis. So that drives it from G1 into the cell cycle. Um, an interesting thing about retinoblastoma protein, um, if you have mutations in this, and we'll, I think we'll look at this again when we cover um, the uh, cancer at the end of the term, um, this is oftentimes um, inactivated in certain eye cancers, and they're really devastating. And so they oftentimes will happen in kids. Um, and, you know, if you're born with a mutant copy of the RB gene, your chances of developing an eye cancer or retinoblastoma um, it becomes really, really high, right? Because you, all you need then is another mutation and a good copy to actually then, you know, lead to an inactive copy of this. And then you have this just active EF2 protein, um, which is constantly driving cells through um, the cell cycle. Um, okay, um, another thing that's really important in the checkpoints and in the, um, in the cell cycle is what happens with DNA damage. Okay, so if you have DNA damage in, let's say, the G1, you're going to get complete arrest of the cell cycle. Okay, and, and that's important, and we've already talked about why that is important. And so here's sort of what happens with that. If you get uh, DNA damage, like a, a double-strand break, that's going to actually lead to activation of the ATM and ATR kinases, um, which then will signal to the checkpoint kinases, check 1 and check 2, um, and these will go on to phosphorylate P53. And once P53 is phosphorylated, one of the things that it does is it will go and bind and lead to transcription of CKIs. These are the, the CDK inhibitor proteins like P21, and then you'll get transcription and translation of the CKIs, and they'll bind to the G1 um, and S uh, CDKs, and then that will actually inactivate them, and you won't start S phase and synthesis phase if there's any damage around and if the cell can detect any damage. Right, and so you don't want to be replicating your DNA if there's DNA damage, and if there's a bunch of double strand breaks around, this is what's going to happen. Okay. Um, now you can sort of study this um, by looking just sort of at ectopic expression of MYC, um, and that can actually uh, basically um, lead to activation of ARF, which is will then bind um, MDM2, which then sort of releases P53 and allows it to do a couple of things like cell cycle arrest or, or apoptosis if, if the cell sort of believes that it can't fix its DNA at all. It will, it will kill itself, otherwise it will arrest it till it can fix the DNA. Um, and so MYC is considered an oncogene, but when overexpressed in cell cultures, it can oftentimes just lead to cell cycle arrest or apoptosis. So there's a, a lot of other things going on um, here. Um, okay, and then the other thing that you need to know is uh, the importance of growth factors, right? And so, because the growth factors are actually required for the cell cycle as well. So you'll have the growth factors binding to a receptor tyrosine kinase. They'll cr oftentimes cross-phosphorylate themselves and basically attract an activated PI3 kinase, which will um, phosphorylate the PI45P2 um, uh, phosphoinositols, and then um, you'll get sort of the, the trimethylated one, and then other things can bind to that and eventually signal to TOR. Um, and TOR is also sensing the amino acid availability, and depending on that, you know, you'll get gene regulatory factors um, as well as activation of things that are going to change translation and um, transcription so that the cells can um, continue to grow. And so what you sort of have here is a combination of growth factors and mitogens um, leading to cell growth and cell division. And oftentimes these can just uh, be extracellular factors that can lead to first cell growth and then cell division, or you, know, you get your extracellular factors that are going to lead to cell growth and cell division um, at the same time.
Um, and this can sort of be studied in cell culture, you know, where you'll basically plate some cells in some rich media and they'll actually grow until they get uh, to a confluent monolayer where they actually have contact inhibition. So they sort of realize that, you know, I shouldn't be growing anymore, um, and so I'm going to stop growing and dividing and undergoing the cell cycle. But then if you oftentimes add a stream of fresh media with sort of the growth factors and the mitogens, um, you can actually stimulate um, more cell division um, within that uh, little region there. Okay, so once again, this contact-dependent inhibition can be alleviated by the mitogens. Um, and here's something that's kind of neat. Uh, so this is um, a Belgian uh, blue bull. It actually has a mutation in this myostatin gene, which is in the TGF beta family. So that's going to basically be a negative regulator of the cell cycle. Um, and what ends up happening is if you don't have the myostatin, the TGF beta family member, um, or a mutation in it and it's non-functional, this, this bull just grows excessive amounts of muscle here. Um, and you can sort of uh, just see that this, this is sort of non-regulated proliferation and, it, and the, the, the bull just has way more muscle than is normal. Um, now, another thing that can happen is uh, ploidy can, can influence cell size, okay? And so sometimes cells can be haploid and so in this case, the cells will be relatively small. If you have a diploid cells, they can tend to be bigger. Um, and then if you have multiple copies of each chromosome, um, sort of like a pentaploid where you'd have five copies of each, you can create a big cell. And we've sort of seen these, um, you know, uh, ploidy before when we looked at the Drosophily polyteen chromosome. It was actually, I think, um, uh, had four copies of each chromosome in that. Um, and so here's just something to sort of uh, leave you with um, and just sort of appreciate that, you know, cell size uh, can oftentimes affect, um, you know, the number of chromosomes and stuff like that. And occasionally these can all fuse together um, to actually lead to, you know, you'll have uh, haploid chromosomes and then they'll sort of fuse together so you get diploids and then eventually um, a single one with five copies of the chromosomes. Um, okay, so that's all I have for uh, today, um, and so next class will be ma uh, March 23rd, where we're going to cover membrane structure um, and an overview of the secretory pathway, um, and then we'll start to get into secretion of membrane proteins. Um, so for that, when the time comes, there's your reading assignment. Um, just remember, uh, Thursday, March 25th is your next exam, um, and the exam will cover lectures um, 9 through 15. Okay, so have a great break, everyone, and I will see you when I get back. Bye-bye.